I'm going to run through uh, uh, biliary drainage and pancreatic malignancy and focus a little bit on options and timing. So uh, here's the anatomy of the uh, pancreas in relation to the uh, uh, duodenum and bile duct. And uh, the pancreas can be divided into the head, body, and tail regions. The common bile duct, important to appreciate, passes through the head of the pancreas before it enters the duodenum. Most cancers of the pancreas occur in the head. And uh, that's why the common bile duct can be squeezed, and in 70% of uh, of the time, patients with pancreatic cancer will present with jaundice, and that's because bile cannot get out uh, because of obstruction um, at the head of the pancreas. So a CT scan uh, that demonstrates a um, lesion in the head of the pancreas, a dilated bile duct, and intrahepatic bile duct dilatation. This is typically what we see in a patient who presents with carcinoma at the head of the pancreas, which is the most, kind of, most common kind of uh, uh, most common location for cancer of the pancreas. So um, one can make a fairly strong case for biliary drainage. And um, sort of in the olden days, it was felt that um, if you had persistent jaundice, this affected cell-mediated immunity, uh, maybe even uh, allowed tumors to progress. Uh, uh, um, jaundice, obstructive jaundice causes coagulopathy, basically lipid-soluble vitamins can't be absorbed, particularly vitamin K. And um, with severe jaundice, even with replacement of vitamin K, you cannot sometimes correct coagulopathy adequately, and surgery can be compromised. Um, patients with jaundice have bile salt deposition in the skins, and, and they have a lot of uh, intractable itching and pruritus, and it's almost impossible to relieve this completely without drainage of, uh, without biliary drainage. Um, Biliary drainage improves appetite for patients and a sense of well-being, and also reduces the risk of chemotoxicity. There are certain chemotherapies that you cannot give in patients um, with bile duct obstruction as they're, as, they're excreted, as they're cleared through the biliary system. So what are the options then for biliary drainage? And uh, so surgical by bypass procedures go back a very, very long time to the time of Halstead at the, end of the cent at the beginning of the century. And at that time, patients who were undergoing um, am ampullary resections or pancreatic resections underwent a cholecystogastrostomy for biliary drainage. So the bile, bile duct, I mean, the uh, gallbladder was drained into the stomach. Mortality with uh, surgical bypass procedures was very high until the 1980s. Um, almost a third of patients died with surgical bypass procedures. Now that's significantly improved, and it's, uh, it's comparable to the risk of endoscopic therapy with biliary stents. How about percutaneous drainage? This is a very effective uh, way of uh, draining the bile duct, particularly when ERCP is not possible. Um, um, a lot of the times external drains are left in, so this internal external drains, one of the uh, the one part of the drain is draining into the small intestine, and the other part is draining outside the abdomen into a bag. Um, more recently, percutaneous self-expanding metal stents can be placed radiologically, and uh, these have excellent outcomes and have done very well. Um, ERCP is really the mainstay of um, biliary drainage, and um, we are evolving away from using plastic stents uh, and into metal stents, and I'll, I'll elaborate on this in just a little bit. Um, and more recently, there is, uh, I guess it's the era of therapeutic endoscopic ultrasound, and there are a manner of ways in which this can be used to accomplish biliary drainage, uh, rendezvous um, maneuver, cholecysto duodenostomy, where the bile duct is punctured using an EUS needle, and then a metal stent is placed between the bile duct and the duodenum. Uh, affecting drainage. And this works well in patients with uh, gastric outlet obstruction, in which case you, the duodenum is obstructed and you can't get to the papilla of batter to do ERCP. And you can also um, fashion a hepaticogastrostomy. You can drain the, typically the left intrahepatic ducts, ductal system into the stomach. So here's the anatomy, just very quickly. Um, 
left and right hepatic ducts in the liver, the common hepatic duct, and this is a common bile, and, and this is a cystic duct coming from the gallbladder, which joins to form the common bile duct, which empties out in the second portion of the duodenum. Uh, the pancreatic duct also empties into this area, and this is housed by the, uh, this is ampulla vater, um, and which houses the sphincter of Odi, which um, um, is responsible for contraction and flow of bile into the duodenum. So this is what an ERCP looks like. This is a uh, side-viewing endoscope. There's some clips from a previous gallbladder surgery. And here, dye is being inserted into the bile duct uh, under radiologic control. Here, now, the pancreatic duct is being, um, uh, bile's in, I mean, contrast in, inserted in the pancreatic duct. And you can see it'll pass by in the head, body, and tail region. So that was a normal ERCP. Uh, this is a patient with pancreatic cancer, and this is very pathognomonic. This is a so-called double duct sign, and if you just imagine the head of the pancreas over here obstructing the bile duct and the pancreatic duct, both ducts are obstructed, and so this is a common, this is a double duct sign. Occasionally you see this with chronic pancreatitis, but it's really a, pretty much a hallmark of pancreatic cancer. Here's a patient with a stricture in the so-called intrapancreatic portion of the common bile duct, so where the, head of the pan where the bile duct goes through the head of the pancreas, and here a plastic stent is placed across the stricture, and this has been a very effective way of drainage. These stents are extremely expense inexpensive. They're 30 to $40. They have these barbs that prevent migration out of the bile duct and into the bile duct. Uh, the problem with these stents is they do clog after two to three months and can result in biliary obstruction and uh, cholangitis. Uh, but that being said, they've served us well for a very, very long time. Um, we now uh, tend to, for a whole variety of reasons, uh, namely less occlusion, longer patency, less cholangitis, use metal expandable stents. And there's a variety of different ones in the market. There's covered stents and uncovered stents, so the two basic types. And then there are stents that foreshorten after placement and stents that don't foreshorten. And this is, this is a very clever delivery system. These stents are held constrained in a, in a, uh, in a membrane, and then this is uh, basically unconstrained at the time of placement, and the stent expands by itself. Typically, these stents are 10 millimeters or 30 French in diameter, as opposed to a plastic stent, so they're three millimeters or 10 French in diameter. So they're three times the diameter of uh, plastic stents. And typically, these will last about seven to nine months in malignant in patients with uh, bile duct obstruction before they need to be replaced or um, revised, as opposed to plastic stents where the longevity is about two and a half months. So um, this is a very sobering study that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, a few years ago. And this is a multicenter study from Amsterdam where they took about 200 patients with pancreatic cancer, and they randomized them into two groups a group that underwent preoperative drainage, uh, followed by surgery, so preoperative drainage with ERCP and placement of plastic stents, versus a group that went to surgery alone. They, the surgical patients were operated within one week, which is pretty impressive. Preoperative drainage was, was four to six weeks, and then surgery. The very high failure rate with ERCP, um, but look over here, they had a 46% complication rate with ERCP. The main complications were related to stent occlusion and cholangitis. So this is pretty horrendous. Uh, this is a graph demonstrating the same thing. So this is the um, early surgery, and this is the pre-op drainage. And again, they fared much worse in this group. And this was very surprising to us. We didn't, it certainly not be in our experience. Um, a number of caveats to this study. So this, uh, study had a very high complication rate. Um, endoscopic sphincter otomy was carried out in most patients. You don't need to do this. This increases the complication rate, particularly that of bleeding. Uh, study also excluded patients who were severely jaundiced, and maybe this is the kind of patient you really want to train. Um, obviously, patients with cholangitis, and at, especially at Yale, a lot of them who get neoadjuvant therapy do uh, may benefit with stenting. Um, I have to agree, and I think most of us feel that those with modest bilirubin elevations and early surgery plan can forego stenting. Again, there's no data with the self-expanding metal stents. This was with a very inferior stent, which is a plastic stent. I think the results would be quite different. Um, this is another kind of uh, fully covered metal stent that we use. It has these anchoring barbs that prevent 
migration out of the duct. Um, here is a, um, an example of uh, the wall, wall flex stent that we use pretty commonly. This is a covered stent. Um, it's, it's easy to remove. Uh, the uncovered stent is lots le less expensive than the covered stent. This is about $2,000, $2,200 in, in cost versus about 1000 for the uncovered stent. Um, these covered stents were first developed to try and prevent stent occlusion by you have a membrane um, surrounding them so you can't, supposedly tumor can't invade through it but tumor does invade above it and below it, and um, actually the patency of the uncovered stent is no better, I mean, or the, co the covered stent is no better than the uncovered stent. Um, so we would elect to place an uncovered stent in a patient when we're doing it for palliative purposes. Um, one of the concerns in the past has been with placement of uncovered stents is does this interfere with surgery? And now it's pretty much well established that it doesn't, provided the end of the stent is, is, is a couple of centimeters below the hepatic bifurcation. So you're able to do your Whipple surgery and it doesn't, it doesn't interfere with that. Um, so just a couple of things about covered and uncovered stents, and I don't want to go into this in detail, so, except to say that the um, covered stents cannot be placed in the intrahepatic bile ducts because they include side branches. There's some also a question of cholecystitis because of the covered stent covering the cystic duct orifice. Um, although this has not been borne out in trials that the risk of covered and uncovered stents for causing cholecystitis and even plastic stents is roughly the same. Um, just want to show you placement of one of these self-expanding metal stents. So this is a very narrow catheter. It's about seven French or two <coughs> millimeters in diameter. And this is inserted through the endoscope channel this is a guide wire into the bile duct, and this is a, uh, the delivery catheter containing the stent placed over a guide wire. And now the stent is nicely positioned in the bile duct where the delivery catheter is. And uh, so to deploy this particular stent, um, a long sort of string is pulled and the stent is basically unconstrained now. And you'll see it pop open in a second. So here's a nice big opening uh, for the stent. Um, so I'm almost uh, finished here, and this is a, um, an example of uh, some uh, pictures of um, EUS guided biliary drainage, uh, very dilated bile duct, which is accessed by, uh, by EUS. Um, and then um, this is the uh, duodenal bulb, and here a um, you know, guide wires passing into the bile duct, and then the tract is dilated, and a metal stent is, um, connects the uh, duodenum to the bile duct. This, a, uh, uh, this technology is still evolving, and um, newer um, um, devices are being, uh, being worked on, but this is some fairly recent data on almost 100 patients in 12 centers in this uh, prospective study. The, this is EUS guided drainage, a 95% successful stent rate, uh, uh, stent placement, uh, procedure time of 40 minutes, which is really pretty excellent. I mean, these were outstanding uh, um, EUS, uh, therapeutic EUS uh, physicians. Patency rate was, was very uh, high, 95% uh, at six months. Um, and there was, you know, significant adverse event rate, but, but not, not awful. So in summary then, biliary drainage in pancreatic cancer, uh, clearly those patients with palliation who have metastatic disease who are not resectable uh, will uh, benefit from placement of a uh, biliary metal stent. Uh, for preoperative drainage, patients who are undergoing neoadjuvant chemotherapy, for the locally advanced patients, for example, who are hopefully are going to be downstaged and be operated on subsequently, those patients with cholangitis, infections of the bowel, like they, they need to be drained. Um, uh, when surgery is delayed for whatever reason, uh, you do need drainage. You can't leave them jaundiced for a long period of time. Uh, so in general, unless the patient's morbid, self-expanding metal stents are preferred to plastic stents. Uh, you have an option of using uncovered versus covered stents. 
And again, at, at the moment, I think U.S. guided drainage is something that's um, a good backup, uh, but it's still evolving. And I think at, some, at one point it will be the standard of care with failed ERCP. Thank you.